I've been a musician all my life. I'm the product of two parents, both of whom were music majors, who embodied their love of music not just in their profession, but in our home. Growing up, I was surrounded by music on almost a daily basis, as my mom's piano students would tromp their way through our kitchen on the way to their lesson. The Canadian brass, Handel's Messiah, and the choir of King's College, Cambridge, were the backdrop for our Christmases. There may have been family caroling sessions and family performance videos recorded and sent off to Graham and Grandpa in Florida. You see, the musical DNA in my family is strong, so it's not surprising that I stand before you as a singer, music educator, and choral conductor. I love music, performing it, teaching it, absorbing it. I can remember from a young age being deeply affected by music and the power it had to bring up emotions which for so many of us are often hidden. At age 13, I heard Samuel Barber's adagio for strings for the first time. Hearing that piece was a revelation. It was haunting. The music was heartbreaking, yet at the same time immeasurably beautiful. There weren't words to describe how I felt upon hearing the piece. And even now, as an adult, I struggle to articulate the emotional pull that music holds over me. What I do know is that for me, musical feeling is not a choice. It comes instinctively, automatically, naturally, like the act of breathing. I think what was happening growing up is I was learning about the beauty of the world through music. I was awakening to an innately human need for connection. I was experiencing and learning empathy. I was being educated about the human condition through music. Music is a deeply human thing. Decades of studies across disciplines have validated the place of music in our human development. There are increasing studies which support the idea that music has biological roots and that we are indeed hardwired to enjoy and engage with music just as we are hardwired for language. Research on many fronts supports this conclusion. There are no societies either today or in the past that did not have some sort of cultural practice which can be described as music. We see the biological connections in our newborns who can recognize a musical beat at two or three days old and sense a missing downbeat in a rhythm pattern. We also know that our newborns prefer singing over speech and as adults we instinctively know this which is why we launch into sing song and sing lullabies to build emotional bonds with our infants and toddlers. I love that ending. As I've grown as a music educator, that shared human response to music so beautifully demonstrated in that video has become the driving force for my work. All of our kids can respond to and grow through the study of music. And if, as the studies suggest, there's a biological and hardwired presence of music in us all, then our schools and communities need to be intentional in supporting that journey of discovery. Beyond the biology, 
Music advocacy is long centered on how the study of music contributes to success in other areas. Our music students learn to problem solve, think creatively. Our students achieve higher grades in high school and on standardized tests. Music performance requires sustained effort, teamwork, discipline, and it encourages risk-taking, all skills valued by employers. But for me, the most important reason that music and music education should be a part of each and every one of our kids' lives, especially in this changing world, is that through the study of music, our students catch a glimpse of other cultures. And through that process, they learn compassion and empathy for others. Music educators have long trumpeted these many benefits, and yet, despite our efforts, there remains a troubling and frustrating disconnect between the research and school policy. Unfortunately, too many of our schools and the culture of those schools places music as an afterthought in the school curriculum and schedule, and too many of our musically inclined students are made to feel less valued when that musical inclination is simply a natural part of who they are. So what's, what's the reason for this disconnect? I would argue that schools are primarily focused on adult priorities. Now, of course, schools are a reflection of the community at large, but I believe that our investments, the priorities, the, the culture of our schools needs to be focused on the needs of the students first, not the adult wants and needs of the community. Now, I'm sure that our school leaders would certainly agree with that statement in principle. But in practice, many of our schools fail to support the needs of all students equally. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, only 29 states define music or the arts as a core academic subject. Six states have no arts requirements at all as part of their K-12 standards. And according to an analysis of the U.S. Department of Education study, in 2012, there were 2.1 million students in a school that offered no music education at all. Now, we know that schools are charged with meeting the needs of important mandated subjects that form the core of the school day. Subjects like English, math, science, which have an attached state assessment. More recently, STEM education has become a priority, and our administrators need to respond to the pressures of those mandates as well. But beyond those requirements, our schools are also charged with making important curricular decisions about the remainder of the school day. And those decisions, those important local decisions, are deeply impactful to the lives of our students. I would argue that those remaining priorities are too much a reflection of the adults in charge, rather than the needs of the students in their charge. Programs like athletics, historically highly valued by adults and society, are given preference in the budgeting process, while music and the arts, less valued by adults, are frequently forced to compete for what's left. What's emerged then in many schools is a budgeting process which is centered around protecting adult priorities, while at the same time solving financial issues on the backs of other less popular programs and all at the expense of student equity. Now, this isn't to say that there hasn't been any investment in music or the arts, there has. Simply that the investments made have frequently been out of balance and are easily at risk when a crisis occurs. Schools exist to serve the public and educate their children, all children. As a parent, shouldn't you expect that your musically inclined child be made to feel just as validated and supported as your young aspiring athlete? If we are truly to see all students equally, then we need to look through their eyes. We need to budget, invest, prioritize with each and every one of them in the forefront of our thinking, and we need to remove from that process any of our adult preferences and biases. We need our schools to be neutral facilitators, neutral, in creating an environment of encouragement 
and acceptance for every student choice. The imbalance that we see in our schools as music educators, it affects us, but more importantly, it, it affects our kids. It affects our kids and their sense of self. Our kids respond to what they see and what they hear around them. They respond to the adult priorities that are around them in their school. How are they made to feel if their natural curiosity, passion for music or the arts isn't reflected around them? How are they made to feel when they walk through the hallways and they know that they aren't a priority? I would suggest to you that what we need to do is work on our kids' mental health in that regard. A few years ago, a TV personality did a story about young Prince George and how he loved, he loved to take ballet as part of his school curriculum. She then proceeded to laugh, asking how long that would last, mocking a boy for enjoying dance. Now, on the surface, that statement seems harmless enough, but in truth, it's indicative the kinds of cultural hurdles that we as adults can place in front of our kids who choose the arts. In both implicit and explicit ways, those kinds of statements and judgments are made by adults every day in schools and communities around the world. And again, all at the expense of our kids' mental health. We must do better. We all yearn to belong as a music educator, we want our kids to walk the halls proudly knowing that they belong. We're asking for the resources to support our work. We're asking that music be an equal part of the school day. We're asking for acknowledgement and respect, but we don't ask those things for ourselves as teachers. We ask those things for our kids on their behalf so that they can feel the same sense, same sense of pride and belonging as their peers. What we need to do is we need to look at each of our uh, kids as a clean slate, absent of preconceived ideas or predetermined goals, something new, fresh, unmarked, or uninfluenced. This is the change that we need. This is the change that we need. The statement that, well, we've always done it this way is no longer acceptable when that status quo has meant no or inadequate music education for millions of children. What if we did this? What if we looked at them as something new, fresh, unmarked, or uninfluenced? What would our schools look like then with that change in mindset? If we did that, schools would make decisions which would validate our kids' natural curiosities and give them permission to embrace their authentic selves. With that change, our kids and our schools would have policies which would validate every student choice. With that change, we would truly make room for music and the arts while uplifting all of our kids. Music can transform lives. I see it every day with my kids. But that transformation isn't talent or musical DNA. It's not about having musical parents. It's about a process of discovery it's discovery of shared effort and teamwork, discipline, and community. It's about learning the universal language of music and through that, getting to know ourselves better in the world. It's about finding a place of self-esteem and belonging. To quote Plato, I would teach children music, physics, and philosophy, but most importantly, music, for the patterns in music and all of the arts are the keys to learning. Can you be an ally? Talk to your school boards and administrators. Demand equity and fairness. Insist on investments that justly support all student programs. But lastly, remind them that music is a part of each and every one of us and that through its study, we celebrate the beauty of humanity and the world in which we live. Together, we can reinvent our schools and create an environment of acceptance, celebration, and pride for and among 
all students. Thank you.